automatic machine learning is, why we want it, and what the recent developments are in this area. None of what I'm going to talk about is my work, but I hope I can give you like a good idea of what's happening in the area. So first, why do we want machine learning? Uh, why do we want automatic machine learning? My personal goal is to make machine learning accessible and easy to use for everybody. Ideally, you shouldn't need to read a book or understand a library or have to, uh, a math background to apply machine learning to a problem. Unfortunately, that's not where we are right now. And so you need to have significant knowledge in machine learning to apply it successfully. Um, sorry. Technical issues? Okay, whatever. So, um, yeah. One of the things that might be my contribution is uh, issues with the current tools. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about scikit-learn because this is sort of the default choice in uh, Python. Um, one of the issues is that there's a lot of documentation, but there's very little that gives you a good point of entry. So if you're a newcomer to machine learning, you don't really know which models should I start with. And um, it's also unclear um, sort of uh, which parameters are important, which parameters you tune. So um, I'm not sure if any of you remembers, but at some point I made this ridiculous flowchart. Uh, it was a bit of a joke because applying machine learning is much more complex than uh, what the chart suggests. Still, people found it quite useful because it, at least it gave them some guidance of what kind of model to pick. Second Learn has, as I said, an extensive user guide, but doesn't really give you a place to start. And it's hard to know which model to try first and uh, which model might be appropriate for a given task. And even more tricky than selecting the model might be selecting the hyperparameters of the model. Most machine learning models have some parameters to tune to get the best performance. Scikit-learn models usually have a ton of options, and not all of them actually change the outcome of the algorithm. Many of them are trade-offs of accuracy versus speed, or they're from, for some very specific use cases. And for a newcomer, it's hard to know which are the important parameters and which are not. Even if you know which parameters to tune, it's still not clear what are good settings and how many different settings to try and should I try on a linear scale or on a logarithmic scale. And um, the final issue with the current situation is that scikit-learn likes to be really Pythonic. So we try to be very explicit about what happens and there's very little to no magic um, going on in the background. That means, however, that you have to be very explicit and you need to take care of everything yourself. So for example, um, for dealing with categorical variables, dealing with missing values, and dealing with scaling data, you have to do all of this yourself. So if you want to apply, say, a support vector machine, you can't just like fit an S uh, SVC estimator, depending on what your data is. You might want to build a pipeline with one hot encoder for the categorical variables, impute the missing values, scale the data, and then apply the SVC. And uh, to a newcomer, it's like very non-obvious that uh, this is what you should do. And there's not really a good place to see, uh, see these best practices. Um, okay, so now I've talked about what the problem is. What uh, should the solution look like for me? So here's my ideal interface. Import the automatic classifier, and when you fit it, it will provide you with a sequence of more and more accurate models over time, and you can stop at any point. Actually, uh, the auto classifier is, actually, is already implemented in the auto SK1 package, and it does sort of this. Unfortunately, it's not entirely uh, where I'd like auto machine learning to be, and I'll talk a bit uh, more about this later. So, um, what are the steps that we need to take um, to get to this automatic machine learning? Step one for me is to automate the parameter selection. Given the particular model, I want my library to know which parameters are important, how they influence the runtime and accuracy, and then search for the best parameter setting on my data set in some smart way. The second step is not only to search the parameters, but also have a candidate list of models and pick out the best model together with the best parameters. This is sometimes called the cache problem or a problem of uh, com uh, combined algorithm selection and hyperparameter optimization. You can get even, uh, go even one step further and ask the library to know uh, which models might be the best for a particular data set. So just not, not just search over everything, but ask what should be good for this. And finally, we want not only to, uh, the model to be selected, we also want the actual pre-processing steps, scaling, and so on. So we want the whole pipeline to be built automatically. So how can we implement this? How can we do this? How do we automate parameter selection, model selection, and pipeline selection? 
First of all, we need to formalize our search space. Even if we just want to select the parameters of a particular model, this search space can be uh, large and quite complex. There is often a mixture of discrete parameters, such as the kernel for support vector machine, and continuous parameters, so just the regularization parameter. And um, there's different ways to deal with continuous and discrete parameters, depending on how you're going to do the search. Um, another thing that's kind of tricky is um, conditional parameters. For example, if you select a particular kernel, this kernel has some parameters. If you select a different kernel, this might have a different set of parameters. So the available options for one parameter depend on what the setting is for the other parameter. So it's not really a grid. It's more like a tree-based parameter space, a tree-shaped parameter space. And uh, not all search methods can deal with that. And if we want to search uh, over the whole pipeline, there's another difficulty, which is searching over the structure of the pipeline. Do we want fixed pipelines, or do we want a fixed length of a pipeline, or um, should, the pi should it be any chain of operations, or do we want to have arbitrary graphs of pro processing? And um, these are important decisions, and they depend, again, on your search strategy. Um, finally, there's also the question that I find very important is what to include in your search space. Should we include all possible models? So AutoSKLearn basically has everything in scikit-learn. Um, do you need that? Should we search over everything or would be a subset enough? So now let's talk about the different methods we can use to search this parameter space once we defined it. The most standard one is exhaustive search, also known as grid search in this context. It's easy to implement and understand, and it's embarrassingly parallel. So you can run it on the cloud or multiple CPUs or whatever. Um, grid search can deal with conditional parameters if you specify them correctly, but you need to discretize continuous parameters. Um, and so you need to know, is, should I search this over log scale, and how many parameters should I try for a um, continuous parameter? Another downside is that you can't naturally trade off uh, computational uh, complexity and uh, accuracy. So you can't just stop a grid search halfway through. That doesn't really make sense. You could lower the resolution of your grid, but that's sort of, um, you can't do that on the fly. Uh, also, if you deal with very complex pipelines or uh, very models with many, many parameters, doing the exhaustive search quickly becomes infeasible. Another straightforward method is randomized search, which samples the parameters for each model um, that we try for a pro from probability distribution. So independently, every time you want to build a model, you uh, sample some random parameters. Randomized search can deal with conditional parameters and is, again, embarrassingly parallel. Randomized search can deal with continuous variables, either by using the continuous distributions or you can discretize the variable and then use discrete distributions. Um, yeah, depending on whether you discretize or not, you uh, either need to pick the appropriate continuous distribution, which can be a bit tr tricky, or you need to find the right discretization. Um, yeah, in contrast to grid search, you can stop at any time and still get a reasonable answer. And if you wait longer, you, can, you just get a better and better answer over time. This is also known as an anytime algorithm that you can stop whenever you feel like it. So that's definitely an advantage. There's another more sophisticated family of methods for searching for parameters known as sequential model-based optimization or Bayesian optimization. These are basically methods for uh, global optimization for any expensive to compute arbitrary function. So this is sort of, I mean, this is an NP hard problem. These are like selection of heuristics to minimize any function. And here our function is the validation accuracy of machine learning model as a function of the parameters to the model. The idea behind all of the uh, SMBO models is to build a probabilistic mapping from the parameter values to the validation accuracy for a particular model and particular set of parameters. We then select uh, iteratively the most promising parameter values and update our model. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna give a short like illustration of this. Here's an example of what it looks like when you're using a Gaussian process for the probabilistic modeling. I'm not sure how well you can see this. Can you see the red line at the top? Okay, good. So um, this is a toy example with a single parameter. On the x-axis in this plot is the parameter setting, and on the y-axis is the error achieved with the setting. In the top row, you can see as a red line the true dependency of the error um, on the parameter. We want to find a minimum of the uh, red dotted function. 
So, um, and uh, so we want, yeah, we want to find the lowest point. And evaluating this function is very expensive. So we start off, we pick one point randomly, which is like the uh, red dot. We try, use this parameter setting, we build our model, we evaluate how well the model uh, does, and then we, we know where this red dot falls. Then we can build a Gaussian process model to model this function. Okay, we only have one point, so the function is not that interesting, it's pretty flat. Um, and you can, so in purple, you can see with the mean and standard deviation what this Gaussian process model is. Then um, we use a strategy count uh, called lower confidence bound to find the most promising next point to try. In this strategy, we select basically the, um, the lowest point according to the standard deviation around the mean. So the lo lowest point in this purple contour. Um, so here the minimum is at the very right corner. So we try this parameter setting, we build a model evaluate, and we get another red point. This is like the second panel. We can use this to update our purple function, and then we can again do the minimization and find the lowest point in the purple contour. And so uh, over time, we evaluate more and more points, and we get closer and closer to the optimum, and we get a better model of the red function. So the purple becomes more and more like the red function, and in particular, where it's close to the minimum, they're more or less the same. The key point here is that evaluating the red function is very expensive. It involves building a machine learning model, maybe on a very large data set. So think about building a large neural network, and it takes a week or something. So we don't want to evaluate a, re a red function very often. But evaluating the purple function, which is our simulation of the red function, is very cheap. So we can run any like brute force um, or more or less brute force search over the purple function to find a minimum. And so we um, kind of try to fit the uh, purple function to the red function and minimize the purple function at the same time. All right, so now that we know the principles behind sequential model-based optimization, um, let's look at the different variants that exist. So the most commonly used one is the Gaussian processes, which we just saw. It's well established and it works well with continuous parameters. However, Gaussian processes can't really handle uh, discrete parameters, and they can't really work with conditional parameters, at least not in their standard implementation. Um, there's also issues with scaling to very many data points. In high dimensions, Gaussian processes uh, also don't work or become quite slow, and if you have many data points, they become slow. So they work well for adjusting a few continuous parameters, but they don't really work well for the kind of pipeline search that we want to do. In terms of how to specify the problem, Gaussian process is actually pretty good because you on, for each parameter, you only need to specify upper and lower bounds and the rest will be automatic. Um, another approach uses a random forest for building the model. Uh, so uh, the purple function is built using a random forest. Random forest can work with continuous and discrete parameters. They can also easily accommodate uh, conditional parameters. They scale well, and they seem to work relatively well in practice. Unfortunately, the literature is more or less um, like just one group that works on this, and uh, there's only a single implementation, but we're probably going to re-implement this pretty soon. In practice, you will discretize the continuous parameters, so you only have like a fixed number of parameters to, uh, to pick from. Um, so the final sort of of the standard uh, sequential model-based optimization is non-parametric um, probabilistic model using tree parts and window estimates. Uh, it was developed by James Bergstra, and it's specifically done to deal with conditional parameters. It seems to work quite well, but it's not really widely adopted. Um, you need to specify this. You need to specify a prior distribution for each of your parameters. So here's a... Uh, comparison, like a uh, quantitative comparison of these three methods and another one, D, uh, DNG on the right. So in this comparison, um, this uses some simple benchmark data sets. The number of evaluation of the expansive function is fixed and we look at how good of a minimum each of the approaches finds. Lower is better. This experiment here is a particular implementation of Gaussian process. Um, the method, yeah, the method on the very right, the DNGO, is um, done by the same people as uh, experiment. Don't worry about that too much. So um, because this is the people that do experiment, it's not very surprising experiment is the best everywhere. Uh, but actually experiment does work quite well. However, these problems, they don't have continuous, uh, sorry, they all have continuous parameters. They don't have conditional parameters. So it might work well in this case, but not in the cases we're interested in. 
Here's another uh, interesting comparison of the methods, uh, which includes a hyperband model, which you shouldn't worry about now, but this is the paper it's from. It shows the rank of each optimization procedure over time on four different tasks. Lower is better, so you want your algorithm always to do the best, so always to be ranked first. So if you had a constant one, you would be uh, the winner. So here the authors also compare against randomized search in green, uh, which is basically entirely stupid because it has no model. So the top green line, this uh, is standard randomized search, which is actually not that bad. Um, what was interesting is they also compared about uh, against two times randomized search, which is basically allowing randomized search to do evaluation for every one evaluation the others um, uh, algorithms did. So basically it's running randomized search at twice the speed. If you run set randomized search at twice the speed, it's better, it beats everything. Um, this is actually not surprising. A lot of people are like, ooh, but okay, it's not, randomized search really works quite well. But so you can see you will get, get less than a two times speed up from be, doing a lot of very fancy math. The, though like less than two times speed up can still be interesting. All right, so now we talked about various strategies for searching over uh, parameters or pipelines. Um, however, if you're a human data scientist, you don't start from scratch each time you, someone hands you a new data set. You don't extensively search over all possibilities. You use some prior knowledge. So how can we jumpstart this process? That's, that leads us to what's called uh, meta-learning, where you try to learn from a collection of data sets and find out what algorithm works well on which kind of data. So the idea of meta-learning is the following. We start with some data set, and we run our pipeline optimization algorithm like any of the things we talked about so far. This gives us a good algorithm and a good parameter setting. Then we do this again for a bunch more of more data sets. This uh, search usually takes quite a while because the search space is quite big. But once we have good parameter settings, we can use these settings to train a machine learning model. This is the meta model that tells us for a particular data set what is a good um, algorithm and good setting of the parameter. To learn this model, we need to represent each data set using what is called meta features. So now the data set becomes, each data set becomes a data point in the meta learning. Um, then to find a model for a new data set, we just need to compute the meta features on a data set and apply our meta model. And the prediction of this is use this algorithm with these parameters. And this is much, much faster than doing the search all over again. So this is like uh, here, this is, utilizing prior knowledge from these other data sets and uh, making a prediction what good parameters are. And so this just, uh, and so the computation is very, very fast. So the meta features that are usually used, so the simplest one are number of samples, number of features, how sparse the problem is. And then there's more complicated features like the moments of the data set and mutual information between features and targets. And then there's so-called landmark features, which is basically, I ran this very simple algorithm and it did this and this well. So you can run um, naive base, which is basically as fast as just counting uh, the features, or you can run a like, simple tree-based method, and then you can use the accuracy of these models as um, a landmark and this as an feature, uh, input feature for your meta-learning. All right, so these are sort of all the techniques that we want to use, we, um, we want to have the search spaces over the uh, pipelines, we have a search algorithm and we have meta learning. And now I wanna talk about the implementations that are actually out there. Um, so my favorite one, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, is the project uh, called AutoSKLearn, which attempts to automate the SKLearn pipelines. It's developed by a group in Freiburg, they're awesome, and you can get it on GitHub and try it out. Um, it uses a fixed setup of the pipeline. I think it's uh, four steps where you can have uh, missing value imputation, scaling, feature selection, then classification or regression. And it uses meta learning using a nearest neighbor classifier. So basically it looks at the data set that is just the closest one in terms of meta features and then uh, uses their setting, the setting. It then uses the, the, what comes out of the meta learning is used as warm starting for their vision optimization. So you don't stop at doing the meta learning, you use this as a starting point for your search. Um, they're doing the search using SMAC, which is the random forest based method, which they actually invented. The package includes an explicit list of parameters to search over, and uh, 
they're like hand coded basically search over these values for each of the algorithms. And there's another uh, library done partially by the same people, but a couple of years earlier, which is AutoVeca, which is a plugin you can download for Weka that does automatic model and parameter search. It can use both SMAC, which is the random forest one, and TPE, which is the uh, tree parsing estimate. Um, it doesn't do meta learning and it doesn't do pipeline selection, so it really does just just so automatically selecting a model and parameters. I don't. I'm not a Weka user, so I don't actually know how well it works. Five minutes. That's going to be interesting. Um, so Hyperopt SKLearn is a project by the creator of the TPE, uh, James Bergstra, and uh, basically it provides a list of parameters to try for some scikit-learn models, and in a form that you can run his um, Hyperopt on it. Hyperopt is his implementation of the TPE. And um, so this is like a nice project, and fortunately I don't know if anyone actually used it ever. Um, but yeah, I think it's actually, actually it works, maybe. But it's only, it searches over uh, models and parameters, but again, not pipelines. Another project I want to mention is uh, Teapot by my friend Randy Olson, who you probably follow on Twitter. Check now, you probably follow him, I'm pretty sure. So um, it uses genetic algorithms to evolve complex pipelines of scikit-learn models together with their parameters. So here you have a lot of freedom in building the pipeline and it can be very complex. Um, However, like the search is then using um, genetic algorithms, which is slightly less sophisticated than the Bayesian optimization ones. Uh, I haven't seen a benchmark on this, but I'd be really curious once he puts one up. Uh, yeah, maybe because I have less time. So Spearmint is just doing an uh, awesome library for just using the model-based optimization. So this only does the search, it doesn't give you any parameter settings. So you can use this to implement your own search. And there's Scikit Optimize, which I'm also more or less going to skip over, which is our re-implementation of the Gaussian process-based search. Whereas by ours, I mean uh, Jilloop and, uh, and Manoj Kumar, and not me at all. Um, then there's things inside Scikit-Learn, grid search, obviously brute force, randomized search, just randomized search. Uh, we will have the Bayesian search CV using Gaussian processes soon. We'll have search over pipelines uh, hopefully soon. And I definitely want to have a list of built-in parameter ranges. So probably I'm going to work together with the auto -SQL learn people so that we have a default grid so that people don't need to expert knowledge to know what kind of parameters to search over, but just have a dictionary there. All right, so, um, so now you might think that all the work's been done, but um, I think it's just the beginning. Here's what I think we should do next. First, we should have a clean separation between um, the definition of the model search space, so all the parameters and the models we want to try, how we want to define the pipelines, then how we want to do the optimization, and how we want to do meta-learning. And these are slightly coupled, but not so much. So these could actually probably be different libraries. Um, yeah, I think the current meta-learning techniques don't really exploit the prior knowledge enough, and I want to improve on that. Um, there's a lot to work on usability. Most of these projects are like research quality, and none of these projects that I mentioned have they consider uh, runtime. So usually you want to try fast algorithms first. If I get the same accuracy with a linear model and with a giant neural network, then I probably want to use the linear model. And none of these algorithms uh, takes us into account. There's a lot of literature, but not so many implementations. Um, Oh yeah, also you probably you want to do data subsampling. There's one algorithm that I um, didn't mention so far, uh, which is um, hyperband, which actually subsamples your data. You can get a lot of speed by just starting with like a quarter of your data, then doing the search. You get good parameters, but it's like four times faster at least. Um, okay, sorry, I have to speed up a little bit because I'm out of time. Um, so some of the criticism that I wanted to mention is randomized search works well which is great. So some people say, oh, why do we need model-based optimization if randomized search works? Well, if I can implement it and then all of you get one and a half times speed up, then I think I should implement it. Um, probably it's not gonna be the first iteration. Uh, a very important question for me is, do we actually need like 100 classifiers? Do we need very complex pipelines? This is the reason why I don't really like the genetic programming so much. If you just use a random forest or just use gradient, uh, gradient boosting, you get like 90% there. And so the question is, what do I need to add to get to 100%? I want a minimum set of models to do well in most cases. So I really want like the most simple approach possible. 
most people I work on this are researchers, so they want the one that they can publish the best. I want the one that takes as little code as possible. Um, yeah. So time is over. Um, interpretability is important, and not all of these have interpretable things. So what I usually say here is buy my book, but luckily <laughs> you actually can get it for free this week if you go uh, there at the bottom to this link. Uh, you can get one O'Reilly book from a selection of like five or six books for free, minus uh, among them. Um, yeah, this is an early release. You can get the printed version in September. And I have some links in the slides and some pointers. Um, so they're on, uh, I'm pro probably gonna tweet them now. They're in my GitHub profile on and on speaker deck. And that's it, thanks. Okay, the lightning talk st start at 4.30, so we got five minutes till then. Um, you can exit while we're taking questions if you want. Um, and I'll bring the mic to you. Yeah, uh, great talk. Uh, one question about the auto Um How do they evaluate the models internally? Do they, for example, use a uh, k-fold and then the one uh, standard uh, deviation method where they select simple methods? that fall within a certain confidence interval? Is it just no, k-fold? I, I think just k-fold. Just k-fold? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to look into it. I'm just curious. Okay, thank you. Another question? I think this is related to the last question, but do you see any issues when you're looking for, say, an absolute minimum on the curve when you're really kind of taking one measurement of <laughs> a process that has a lot of random elements in it? Or, you know, for example, if you're measuring the absolute error of using like one particular data set um, and you're trying really hard to find the minimum point in the curve, but you know, you're not getting an exact measurement anyway. So, I mean, the cross-validation protects a little bit against that, but it's an issue. Um, and I mean, the, the evaluation is always obviously on a separate test set for each of the algorithms. And then you have, for the meta learning, you have a, test set of data sets, right? Um, so you have a training set of data sets and you have a test set of data sets. Um, but still, yeah. I mean, if you fit too much, you can still overfit during your search, then your test accuracy will not be good. So you can, yeah, the cross-validation sort of helps against this. I think what we should also probably be doing is there's some things using um, differential privacy, which basically tells you, you can try this often before you overfit. Yeah, it almost seems like you could save some time by saying, oh, if I'm not getting new values that are this much lower um, in terms of error, then I'm really not gaining anything, and so yeah. I might as well just take <laughs> one of these parameter values. Yeah. I mean, th th these are, there's like a class of algorithm called racing algorithms, which basically give you guarantees when you can stop. Um, here, for these algorithms usually, um, and for practical settings, you can just like keep running. And uh, so when a user like, thinks they want to stop when they wanna go home, then they can stop. Or, but you can also yeah, give like a model and guarantees when to stop. Time for one more. Time for lightning so talks. I feel like I should know this, but I don't. Um, with the randomized approach, the simple randomized yeah. approach, what distribution is used so, to, to choose? So there's different ways. So if you look at Berkstar's paper, he's really like use continuous distributions because only this will give you the actual benefit of having a high resolution. Uh, the paper where I showed the curves from, yeah. they use uh, uniform distribution over all the discrete uh, choices. Okay, awesome. So that actually, yeah, that seemed to have worked very well. I was kind of surprised because, but I think it's because most of the parameters are continuous and it puts in the prior knowledge about uh, how you should discretize. So, I mean, auto -S it uses those things from auto -SK Learn, and auto -SK Learn they put some work into discretizing the parameters in a way that makes sense. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's give you one more round of applause and the lightning talks are up next. <laughs> <laughs>